Hi, it's great to be here with you today as we continue in the second of our series of messages looking at some of the extraordinary claims that Jesus made about himself in John's gospel. Each claim implied that he was more than just a human being, that he had a divine nature and that he was God in the form of man. And each of these claims tells us something about his nature and who he is and something about us. And each of them began with, I am, I am something. So last week we looked at the claim that he made when he said, I am the bread of life. Well, this week we're looking at a second claim that he made when he said, I am the light of the world. And we're gonna see if we can understand what Jesus was saying about himself and how that's relevant to us today. So let's take a look at the verse where he makes that claim in John 8, chapter 12. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Well, to make sure we don't misinterpret anything Jesus says in the Bible, the first thing we always try and do is to put the verse into context. So what was happening here? Well, if we look at the chapter just before this verse, we find out that it was the time of the Feast of Tabernacles or the Festival of Tabernacles. The festival was to celebrate the release of the Jewish people from captivity in Egypt. And one part of that festival celebrates how God gave the Jewish people a pillar of fire to follow by night and to reassure them, assure them that the presence of God was with them. And the Jewish people remembered this presence by lighting four great big oil lamps on top of pillars about 80 feet high in the four corners of the outer courts of the temple. And these huge lamps would give off a really bright light, or at least brighten the standards of those days, and they would be kept alight right through until the end of the festival. So the place where Jesus had chosen to preach was in the most outer part of the temple, the treasury area, where these four burning pillars were set in the corners of the courtyard and where everybody was allowed to go, the people just like you and me, the, of the world of that day. So picture the scene, right? Everybody would have been sitting around in this outer courtyard and it was probably a slightly chilly evening in October and getting dark by now. And remember, this is a public place, so anyone can say what they like here, really. And then this unusual teacher stands up and maybe gets on top of a slightly raised up block in the courtyard. And he waits for some hush. And then he gestures with his arms towards one of the brightly burning candles in the corner and says, I am the light of the world. He, well, of course, you and I have read this claim from Jesus many times over, so it doesn't really seem particularly odd to us at all. But just imagine that you were there and it's the very first time that you've ever heard anyone say something like this. And you're looking at this man who seems to be genuinely claiming that he is the light of the world. Well, some of you would be thinking, oh, there's gonna be a problem now. One of the Pharisees is gonna come and appear on his arm and tell him, tell him to sit down right now. Or maybe you'd be thinking, what am I missing here? I presume this is meant to be a joke, but I just can't see the funny line here. Well, some of the people may have thought like that, but I suspect the majority of the people there would have actually recognized there was something a bit deeper going on here, that he wasn't trying to make a joke, but that he was actually trying to convey a serious message. But they certainly wouldn't have, would have been struggling to understand exactly what the message was that he was trying to convey. So what did he mean when he said, I'm the light of the world? Well, remember the people who are listening to him were in the temple courts. They didn't go there to play football or to watch the latest blockbuster movie. They were there to hear the scriptures being read and to hear the teachers of the law explain those scriptures to them, to enlighten them. They were searching for light. But now this man standing in front of them and is claiming to be the light that they're searching, not the scriptures. They'd been taught that the scriptures were the light they needed to follow. But here, this man is claiming that he replaces the scriptures. So it's no wonder that they had a problem. But Jesus was going even further than just claiming to be the light that they were looking for, because he was claiming that no one else was that light either, that there could be no other light that could lead them. He was claiming that he was the light of the world. The people hearing him would have been struggling with the way he said, I, when he said, I am the light of the world, because of the emphasis that he put on it. We can't see that emphasis in the English translation of the words, 
But the way it was written in the Greek text tells us that the way he said I and emphasized it was like saying I and I alone or I and no one else. And he made it even clearer, of course, because he continued in the statement saying, I am the light of the world, not I am a light of the world. So he was claiming to be the only spiritual light. He was setting himself up above the scriptures. Actually, he was claiming to be God. And that would have really troubled some of the listeners. So it's not really surprising that the Pharisees got incredibly upset with him. Let's read the next verse in John 8. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not, va not valid. They didn't ask, why on earth do you say that? What do you mean by it? No, they asked, on whose authority are you talking? Why should we believe your claim to be the light of the world? You see, the problem was that when Jesus claimed to be the only source of spiritual light, that implied that the Pharisees were not the source of spiritual light, nor even a source of spiritual light, because Jesus was claiming to be the light of the world. And of course, the Pharisees considered themselves to be the source of spiritual light. It was their job to interpret the scriptures and direct and instruct the people in the ways of the law. And because they were the only ones allowed to interpret the scriptures, probably the only ones who could actually read them anyway, they set themselves up as the definitive source of truth. You see, the teachers of the law in Jesus' day weren't teaching the message embodied in the scriptures. They were making their interpretation of the law and teaching obedience to the letter of the law. They were teaching people that what God wanted was for them to obey every tiny little instruction of the law. And they didn't really pay any attention to the attitude of anyone's heart, so long as everyone carried out every little ritual set out in the law, as interpreted by them. What they were really teaching was legalism. And some people today still think that being a Christian, being a follower of Christ, is just like that. So long as they try to follow really carefully every little instruction given to them in the Bible about the things they should or shouldn't do, and go to church once a week, or at least watch online once a week, or say their prayers once a day, or whatever ritual it is that they believe the Bible is instructing them to do, then they're following Jesus, following his spiritual light. But that's exactly the same problem as Jesus was facing then. Only today we have another word for it, we call it religion. Not being a follower of Jesus, it's a follower of religion. And there are other people today who seem to forget that Jesus said he was the only true source of spiritual light. And instead, they surround themselves with attractive teachings from other religions and try and merge the things that they like from other religions into their life following Jesus. Well, that has a name too. We call that polytheism. And then there are some people who allow their lives to be controlled by superstitions believing that some terrible fate is really going to befall them if they walk under a ladder or that if they break a mirror, they're destined to have seven years of bad luck. Or the number four or 13 somehow has magical power to cause terrible things to happen to them. Jesus said he is the only true source of spiritual light. So if we recognize that he's the light and that he's the only source of light, what does he expect us to do with that light? Well, he wants us to use that light to find our way in life. I remember when I was a young boy, maybe six years old, and we'd recently moved into a new house, and it was the first time I had my own bedroom. Not a very big bedroom. Um, in fact, it was so small, my tiny little bed used to have to go up against the wall during the day so that I could actually move around in the room and open the chest of drawers that lived at the end of my bed. But nevertheless, it was my room. And up until that point, I'd always shared a room with my brother. Well, this one night, I had a bad dream. And I remember determining that the appropriate course of action must be to go to my mum and dad's bedroom and sleep the rest of the night in their bed. Well, you know what young children are like when they wake up halfway through the night. And I wasn't exactly any different. Uh, and I was still unfamiliar with my bed as well and thought that I remembered, thought where I remembered leaving the door last night but there was something in my way, so I had to move it. And then there was something else in my way, so I tried to move that and it wouldn't move. And then the door suddenly didn't seem to be where I'd left it either. So I tried to go back the way I'd come, 
but there was something in the way and I tried to move that and I found myself trapped. Seemed to be solid walls hemming me in on every side and into a small space and I was scared. So I did what every little boy does when they're scared at a time like that. I began shouting out to my mum and dad at the top of my voice whilst I crouched in the corner of my tiny prison and covered my head and hoped that the, uh, the nasty monsters that I had been dreaming about weren't going to come and eat me because I was trapped in this place or because somebody had stolen the door. Well, of course, all my dad had to actually do was to turn on the light in my bedroom and the darkness was instantly dispelled and I could see exactly where I was. I was nose to nose with the back of the bookcase, which I'd somehow managed to pull away from the wall and then got myself stuck in behind it. And then I'd moved other furniture around to imprison myself behind the bookcase. And the door was exactly where I'd left it when I went to bed. But it was only when the light was turned on that I was able to see that my prism was actually a very small three foot high wall. And that if I'd simply stood up, not only could I actually have seen my way out by moving the bookcase, I could have also reached the light, which was just above my head. <laughs> but without the light, I was lost and I was confused. I needed that light to see my way out of the prison that I'd made for myself. And that's what Jesus does for us. He's like my father coming into my room and switching the bedroom light on. And as soon as the light entered the room, everything became clear and I could see. But sometimes we choose to ignore that light. It's like Jesus is standing there saying, shall I turn the light on? And we put our fingers in our ears and we close our eyes tightly because we don't actually want to see the way out of our, our mess. We don't want to listen to his voice. Imagine if you were in a really dark wood and you got no torch or any light that you could see anywhere. The moon is completely behind a thick cloud, so it's pitch black around you. And you've got no idea which, is, which way is out of this wood. And then suddenly a man appears out of nowhere and he has a torch and he's able to light up the way for you. And he says to you, come on, come on, follow me out of these woods. You just need to follow me. So easy. You think you would be an idiot not to choose to follow him. But so often we don't. Time and time again, we instead choose to wander off on our own and say, no, thank you. I, I, I can work out which way to go, Jesus. I don't need your light. I can find the best way to get there all on my own, in my own way, taking my route. I don't need your help here. And then we wonder why we end up in deep mud or tripping over something in our path. You see, as we wander off into the forest and go our own way, the light that was there for us to follow gets dimmer and dimmer as we wander further and further away until eventually we can't even see it anymore. It hasn't gone out. We just can't see it. We let the darkness come back into our lives and we determine that our way is the right way because we chose it. But what we've really done is we've opted to wander away from the light that would have shown us that our way was wrong. That man in the woods doesn't come running after us and grab our arm and force us to go his way saying, no, 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 follow me and follow my light, it's this way. He's far too loving to force us to follow the way that he wants us to go. Jesus is the light of the world. He's lit up the way for us to live. He's trailblazed the way. He's shown us how we can do it. All we need to do is follow the way that he's leading us. So now we know what he meant when he said, I am the light of the world. We need to ask why he said it. What are the implications of him being the light of the world, of him being the only source of light of goodness and of truth? of him lighting the way for us. Well, let's read the verse once again. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So if you break the verse down into its parts, actually it's a lot more than just a statement that Jesus is the light of the world, because the statement is followed by a condition. And then there are two promises. Whoever follows me, or if you follow me, that's the condition will never walk in darkness. That's the first promise, but will have the light of light. And that's the second promise. You notice that Jesus says, whoever follows me. Remember, he's talking to ordinary folk who've come to the most public part of the temple where no one was excluded. So he's not saying, if you Pharisees follow me or if the pastors of ICA follow me, but whoever follows me, meaning me, you, 
Mr. and Mrs. Chan, that person at work who treats you so badly, uh, that, that criminal that you read about in the South China Morning Post who did the most unbelievably awful things, whoever. It's an open invitation to absolutely anyone and to absolutely everyone. There's no quota that's gonna get filled up before we get there here, whoever. And the condition is whoever follows me, follows my teachings, surrenders their life to me, lets their life be directed by me. If you follow the light from that torch that I'm offering to you in the dark woods, so then the promises are for believers in him. They're not for those people who don't have a relationship with him. And then come the promises. Remember, if you follow me, you will never walk in darkness. Well, that doesn't mean that if we follow him, we'll never stub our toe again on a dark night. It's not even saying that if we follow him, we'll always be able to see the way and always know what to do either. Actually, if you've been following Jesus for any length of time, you'll be painfully aware that sometimes we face situations and we just don't have the answers to hand as to what to do. And the way forward can look immensely confusing to us. When Jesus said, you will never walk in darkness, he's referring to our new life in him. We'll never have to live the way that we used to live. We'll never have to follow the way that we used to follow, living with sin or the enemy as our boss, our master, controlling us. Jesus has given us a new life and we can be certain that new life is going somewhere. Once we have Jesus in our lives, then we can be assured forever that he's forgiven us of our sins. We'll never have to wonder if we're right with God or whether he loves us. We'll never walk in darkness again, wondering about these things. And it's a promise because Jesus is God and God can't lie. Anything he says is true. So he doesn't need to say, if you follow me, I promise you that you'll never walk in darkness. He's God. If he says you will never walk in darkness, you will never walk in darkness. It will be so. He only has to say something will happen and it will, just as he only had to speak and the whole world was created. He doesn't need to stress his words with, I promise, because if he says it, we can believe it because he's God. So you and I can think of it as a promise that God has made to us. And then there's the second promise, you will have the light of light. Well, how does that fit into this? What's the light of life? What does that mean? Well, there's a simple answer to this. Think of the sun. If the sun went out, then all life on earth would eventually die out. No light equals no life. If it's dark everywhere, there's only gonna be death, no life. But if you have light, there can be life. That light can give life. What does the verse say? You will have the light of life. But the Bible also gives us an answer for this. You see, throughout John's gospel, light and life are used interchangeably. Different words, but the very same idea. Let's look at uh, John 1, verse 4. In him, in Jesus, was the light. And the life, meaning Jesus, was the light of men. So Jesus was the life of men and Jesus was the light of men. So life and light are synonymous. Life is used as another word for light and light is used as another word for life. They're the same thing. So the light that Jesus gives to us is the same thing as saying the life that Jesus gives to us, eternal life. Now remember the second promise, you will have the light of life. So now Jesus is promising that if we follow him, we will have that same light that Jesus has, that same life, life, so that, that Jesus has too. So where does that take us? Well, if we just dig a bit further and look at Matthew 5, verses 14 to 16, here Jesus is speaking, and this is the part of the, part of the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You are the light of the world. So what happened here then? Before Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and now he's saying, you are the light of the world. And once again, he's talking to ordinary folk here, just like you and me. So he means that we are the light of the world. 
Well, the second promise that he gave at the Feast of Tabernacles, you will have the light of life, actually starts to make a bit more sense now too. Because what's happened now is that we have acquired his light and his life. Firstly, he was the light of the world. And now that light, that life has been passed on to us too. And so we too are the light of the world. In other words, you and I have become his light in the world. What's really happening is that we're actually reflecting his light. Think about those uh, not so new LED torches and how they work. They use an incredibly simple technology to create amazingly large amounts of light. That, that tiny little LED bulb is reflected by carefully shaped mirrors such that it seems to create way more light than it was when it was just a tiny little bulb standing on its own. You and I, if we follow Jesus, are reflecting that same light that Jesus emits. He's like the bulb in the torch and we're like the reflector. And he wants us to reflect his light, to attract others, to help guide others to him. And everyone needs to be able to see that reflection. And the way they see that reflection is simply through the way that we live our lives in front of them. Let's read the middle part of that verse again. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Have you ever set up a lantern outside in the dark and seen how all the flying nightlife is attracted to that light? Don't ask me why they flock to it, but they definitely do. And they get in your hair and they get in your face and the mosquitoes start buzzing around your ears, you know. They're everywhere because they just go on being attracted to that light. And it's the same with us too, as we reflect Jesus' light. It just attracts people. That's what Jesus wants us to do. He didn't give us the secret of his life and eternal life for us to bottle it up and hide it. It's for sharing with others. But so often we just want to blend in with the world and we don't want to be seen and we don't want to stand out. We hide our light under a bowl or under a bushel. You're not going to be the light of the world if you cover up or dim it as much as possible. And you know what? You're probably not going to be very successful anyway, because if you're a light, you just can't merge it into the darkness. If you shine a torch somewhere that was dark, it won't be dark anymore, because as soon as light exists anywhere, any darkness around it is simply just dispelled by it. The darkness can't win over it. I made a darkroom once back in the days when we didn't have digital cameras and it was uh, in a cupboard under the stairs in my house. And although you see everyone working under a dim red light in the movies when they're doing this, when they're developing pictures, the, the very first part of the process has to be done in total darkness, which of course is why you never actually see that part in the movies because it doesn't make very entertaining watching unless it's a horror movie and something terrible is going to happen. But you have to take the roll of exposed film out of, its, out of the camera, out of its cartridge, and put it into a little tank where you can immerse it in different chemicals to develop the negatives. And that has to be done in total darkness. Even the tiniest bit of light is going to ruin that process and make all your negatives just turn out useless. And I would have to sit in that little cupboard in the dark for ages, waiting for my eyes to adjust, looking for little patches of light coming into the cupboard, and then I'd have to plug that gap around the hinge or that hole in the floorboards. They were only ever tiny little holes. But you know, after a couple of minutes of just sitting there, I could see everything in the room from just one of those tiny little gaps. The light always won, and the light was desperate to show itself to me. Even if you try to hide your light under a bowl, some of it's going to get out. People will know that you're a follower of Jesus, so why not just let it go? Most of you will probably already have heard the very sad news that Pastor Cloud passed away last month. Pastor Ed was telling some of us uh, about a time recently when he and Pastor Cloud were talking and remembering Pastor Cloud's vision of ICA. Pastor Cloud had a vision of a light, and a, a light going out from ICA and then going on beyond to all the nations a vision of ICA taking that light to where it wasn't. We have the light of the world and the world needs that light. It's not the light of the church. The church is already pretty well lit with you and I in it. Your individual light isn't gonna make very much impact in here. 
But when you take it outside to a place where it's dark, think of the impact, even just a small light in a really dark place can be, just like in my darkroom. Pastor Cloud's vision of ICA is happening today and has been happening for some time. It wasn't a vision of the light of the pastors of ICA going out into the world, or even all of the pastors of ICA going out into the world. It was a vision of yours and my light. ICA as a church, it's the light of the people of ICA, all of us going out into the world. We need to join together to take our light into the world because that way it's brighter. That's what our ministries are about. That's what Manor is about. All our ministries involved a team of people from all over ICA, and they take the light of Jesus, our light, the light that the people of ICA have been given to people in need in Hong Kong. That's what mission trips are about, taking the light from ICA to other nations. That's even what our live streaming or our Zoom healing room meetings are all about, taking the light to wherever people can access the internet. When we get together to take the light to the world, our light becomes so much brighter. I came to realize this truth, that when we join together, our lights become much brighter quite early on in my working life, almost 30 years ago, when I was uh, working in London. I remember there was a lady in our department at work and it was her birthday. And we decided to surprise her with a cake at her desk in the office. And I was determined that we should have a candle for every year. The problem was that she was 60 that year. And that meant rather a lot of candles all over the top of the cake. So I carefully positioned each of them, evenly spread right out over the whole of the top of the cake. And I got some colleagues to help me and we lit them. All good so far. Now, look what Jesus said. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. The point Jesus was making was that the light from each house when you put all of those individual lights close together, standing next to each other, they all seem to join as one and become a much, much bigger, brighter light. And that's exactly what happened with my candles. As I walked to this lady's desk, the wind that I created as I walked caused all of the flames from each candle to fuse together and become one much, much bigger, brighter flame, all burning as one. And now about four feet tall as well. And believe me, there was no hiding that light that was a bright light. Sadly, the cake never quite made it to its rightful recipient, uh, but ended up in the washroom being doused with cold water. You and I, we are a city on a hill. So today, I just want to encourage you to think about yourself and how you live your life, how you've been putting your light under a bushel or not. Have you been trying to blend in with everyone else because you don't believe that your life as a believer will attract others. If you have, then it's time for you to uncover it. God wants your light to be seen by everyone because your light is pointing the way to him for others. You may think, and you may have all sorts of reasons why you should keep your light from others, but that isn't why God gave it to you. You're the light of the world and he wants you to let that light shine out. All the darkness around you in your place of work, in your school, in your social group, in your sports team, all that darkness is just the absence of light, your light. So all you have to do is to take the bowl or the bushel away and then darkness around you is gonna be illuminated just by being you, just like that. It's not about what you have to do to make your light shine, it's already shining, even when it's under the bowl. It's just about not hiding it anymore. Your life already reflects Jesus if you're his follower, just by living the way life comes naturally to you because the Holy Spirit inside of you is constantly shaping you and me and forming us and making us more like Jesus as we follow him. And that's attractive to people who don't have Jesus in their life. Jesus wants us to let people see who we are, to notice that we're different and for them to see what we do because that will bring glory to him. Look at verse 16 again. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So you can bring glory to God today just by letting your light shine. And I want to encourage you this week to look out for the moment that comes along when you have to make a choice whether to let your light shine or to whether to hide it. 
and let it shine. God wants your light to get out because your actions will result in others glorifying God. Let's pray together. Father, sometimes we're just so afraid and we just bury inside us the fact that you are a light. You are the person who has made us into the light of the world. We are your light in the world. Father, just help us to let it go, to let that light come out so that we can bring glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us join with all of heaven singing more.